Over just 100 days, in a little-known theater of the Second World War, the quiet son of a Finnish farmer would claim the lives of as many as 540 Red Army soldiers. He would do so whilst fighting in the most extreme winter weather conditions imaginable, under heavy fire from Soviet artillery, and all the while using an outdated rifle which he'd brought from home. His name was Simo Hoha, but to those who knew and feared him, he was called the White Death. This is his story. Simuna, a quiet country boy. You'd be forgiven for expecting that the man who would come to be known as the most effective and deadly sniper in all of military history must have had a remarkable upbringing. In truth, however, the childhood of Simu Hauha was anything but extraordinary. It was, by the standards at the time, about as normal a childhood as one could have. And yet, it is precisely this ordinariness which makes Simo's story so compelling. Simo Hoha, or Simuna, as he was known by his family, was born on the 17th of December, 1905, into a simple farming community in the hamlet of Kiskinen, in the Vipuri province of southern Finland. One of eight children, he was a small and shy boy who often kept to himself and who was more than content to help his mother and father, Katrina and Juho, at work on the farm. When Simuna wasn't at school in the neighboring village of Meitila, or at his parents' Lutheran church, he could be found building his strength and dexterity and familiarizing himself with nature whilst out hunting and skiing. It was here, in the dense forests of the Finnish wilderness, that Simuna first learned the survival tactics which would make him such a formidable foe later in life. In addition to practicing his sharpshooting as a hunter, little Hauha would come out of his shell when competing in local shooting competitions at the Finnish Civil Guards shooting range, located just five kilometers down the road from his family home. He'd soon join the Civil Guard, a voluntary militia, at the age of 17. According to his friends, Simuna's house was full of trophies for his marksmanship. Little did Simuna Hauha know but the rolling fields and idyllic countryside of his youth would, by his 34th birthday, become the broiling and bloody battlefield on which he'd make his name. Mandatory Service Simo and his famous rifle The country of Finland was created as a product of war. Following its independence from Russia when Simo was 12, the country descended once more into bloodshed. Simo's home province of Vipuri allied itself with the Finnish communist faction, and thus the losing side. With warfare at the very heart of Finland's existence, it is perhaps little wonder that military service was made mandatory for every man over the age of 18. To this day, Finland has one of the highest levels of conscription of any country in the world. Soon after his 19th birthday in 1925, Simo Hauha enrolled for his mandatory 15-month military service as a member of Bicycle Battalion 2 in a place called Raivola, which is now a part of Russia. There, he received basic military training, including training in the tactics peculiar to the Finnish armed forces, such as how to fight, survive, and move unseen in snow, over mountains, and in dense woodlands. During training, the teenage Simo caught the eye of one Major Tapio Saralainen, the man who would later become Hauha's biographer. Major Saralainen recalled that Simo, despite being a new recruit, could accomplish incredible feats. For one, he could estimate distances up to 150 meters away to the nearest meter, which in imperial measurements means Simo could call distances with an accuracy of 3.3 feet up to 500 feet away. Furthermore, during a firing practice one day, the Major was yet again blown away when young Hauha hit a target 150 meters away 16 times in under a minute. The Major recalled, this was an unbelievable accomplishment with a bolt-action rifle. 
considering that each cartridge had to be manually fed with a fixed magazine that held together five cartridges. By the time Simo's compulsory service was over, he had risen to the rank of corporal. Even more important than this symbolic reward, however, was what Simo physically took with him. When he returned to life on the family farm, he bought the rifle he'd been trained with, an M2830 Mosin Nagant. Fourteen years later, it would be this very same rifle which would drive fear into the hearts of the Red Army. Invasion A Brief History of Finno-Soviet Relations At this point in our story, it's worth taking a moment to provide a little context. You see, the war in which Simo Hauha would fight was hardly the first time there had been hostilities between Russia and Finland. In fact, the only reason Finland came into being in the first place was due to a Russian war. Way back in the earliest years of the 19th century, Finland didn't exist. Instead, all of the land we know today as Finland was simply the eastern half of the Kingdom of Sweden. And Russia? Well, Russia didn't much like the Kingdom of Sweden. In a year-long engagement, which would later become known as the Finnish War of 1808-09, Russian Tsar Alexander I conquered a large swathe of Sweden, defeating and arresting the Swedish king Gustav IV Adolf. In turn, Alexander I designated these new lands, from Lake Ladoga in the south to Lapland in the north, as the Grand Duchy of Finland, an autonomous part of the Russian Empire and a buffer state between Russia and the newly diminished Sweden. For over a hundred years, Finland remained a Grand Duchy of the Russian Empire. But by the end of the 19th century, relations between the two were turning sour. Russia was pushing to assimilate Finland further into the empire, whilst native Finns were pushing for self-determination. Thus, when communist leader Vladimir Lenin announced that all national minorities had a right to secede from Russia, in the aftermath of the October Revolution of 1917, Finland took its chance and declared itself a separate state. What followed was a short and bloody civil war, similar to that which occurred in Russia and fought between two dominant factions, the Whites and Reds. The Whites comprised the right-wing nationalists and monarchists of Finland's elite, whilst the Reds were made up of leftists, socialists, factory laborers and peasant farmers like those of Simo Hauha's family. After just four months, the Whites emerged victorious, shaping Finland's future for decades to come. Yet, with the exact opposite outcome resulting from the Russian Civil War, political tensions between the two countries would soon begin to mount. Thus it was that, despite the signing of a long-binding Soviet-Finnish non-aggression pact in 1932, Joseph Stalin became determined to reconquer the country which had once been a part of Tsarist Russia. Citing concerns for the security of Leningrad, which sat just miles from the Russian-Finnish border, Stalin renounced the non-aggression pact and launched an invasion of Finland on the 30th of November, 1939. The Winter War. 100 days of snow and sorrow. What ensued was a single winter of fighting between the Red Army and Finland's conscripts. Stalin, despite the private reservations of many of his top generals, believed so strongly that he would be able to destroy Finland completely that he even had his officers issue commands to soldiers to be careful not to go too far and cross over into Sweden. Much to Uncle Joe's surprise, however, the Red Army would barely make it over the Finnish border. In the border regions in which Simo Hauha had grown up, the terrain was challenging, to say the least. Much of it was, in fact, completely impassable, from swampland to trackless forests and mountainsides. The geography made a blitzkrieg-type offensive effectively impossible. Nevertheless, the Red Army outnumbered the Finns by three to one and was wildly better equipped. Whilst Finnish soldiers like Simo had to, at times, loot the bodies of dead Soviet soldiers just to replenish their ammunition, the Russians had yet to expand any of their huge stores of material stockpiled during the industrialization of Russia over the previous decade. Moreover, 
In contrast to Finland's 32 tanks and 114 aircraft, the Red Army had around 4,000 tanks and 4,000 aircraft. So, why was it then that the Red Army failed so spectacularly in their mission? Why was it that by the signing of the Moscow Peace Treaty in March 1940, the USSR had suffered around 350,000 casualties, whilst Finland's casualties numbered just 70,000 in comparison? The answer lies in the fact that the Red Army was woefully unprepared to fight in the extreme terrain of the Finnish borderlands. Despite it being the coldest winter on record for Finland, with temperatures dropping to between minus 40 and minus 20 degrees Celsius, they didn't have warm enough clothes. And the clothes they did have were green, making them easy targets for Finnish sharpshooters against the white of the snow. Moreover, Stalin's infamous purges of the previous year had robbed the Red Army of the vast majority of its competent officer class. By the time of the Winter War, it was instead led by inexperienced youngsters. The Finns, on the other hand, knew their homeland intimately and had a huge body of reservists who had been trained to fight in winter conditions. Their field uniforms were camouflaged white and were warm and insulated, and they knew how to maneuver terrain, which, to the Russians, seemed impregnable. Of course, when it came to defending itself from the most formidable army the world had ever known, Finland also had one last trick up its sleeve. A trick by the name of Simo Hauha, White Death and the Magic Shooter. Simo becomes a legend. In 1938, as hostilities across Europe broke out, Simo Hauha was put through sniper training for the very first time. There, he married his own innate knowledge of the Finnish countryside, hunting and survival techniques learned as a child with the hyper-specialized tactics of a marksman. As a reservist, when war broke out the following winter, in November 1939, he was called to active duty. Simo never took undue pleasure in his role as a sniper in the 6th Company of Infantry Regiment 34. Years later, when asked about his achievements, he'd simply state I did what I was told to do, as well as I could. There would be no Finland unless everyone else had done the same. Nevertheless, Simo quickly made a name for himself as a harbinger of death. Within just the first 22 days of the conflict, the military chaplain Antti Rantama, who knew Simo well, reported that the now 34-year-old sharpshooter had clocked 138 confirmed kills. On the second to last day of this immense killing streak, Hauha would achieve his highest daily count of the war, taking the lives of 25 Red Army soldiers in the time it took for the winter sun to rise and fall. Simo was so deadly, so accurate and so stealthy that he almost immediately earned himself two distinct nicknames. To his friends in the guerrilla-style Finnish army, he was the magic shooter, but to the propaganda arm of the Finnish wartime government, however, he was something else entirely. He was a symbol, a hero of mythological proportions. He was a menace to the enemy, and he needed a menacing name. Thus, they dubbed him the White Death. It is perhaps fitting that White Death was also the Soviet's name for the crippling Finnish winter which claimed their soldiers' fingers, toes, noses, and all too often, lives. For Simo was just as deadly as nature and equally impossible to defeat. Simo Hauha, the White Death, approached sniping the same way he had approached hunting moose and deer as a boy. He would spend hours scouting for the very best sniping positions where the enemy would be unlikely to see him but where he'd still have an optimal field of fire. Next, he'd get up long before sunrise and hike to his chosen position. Simo would prepare the spot by building snowbanks up around him for additional cover. He'd compress the snow beneath his rifle barrel or pour water on it so that it would freeze. 
and this way made sure that his position wouldn't be given away by puffs of snow caused by his muzzle blast. He'd even place a pair of gloves between his weapon and the ground so as to dampen its recoil. Simo did a few other unusual things as well. Whilst most snipers shoot from a prone position to minimize the target area of their bodies, Simo chose instead to shoot whilst crouching, because he said it improved his aim. He'd hold snow in his mouth whilst on a mission, so that his breath didn't condensate on the air, and when he wasn't chewing ice, he'd consume the bread and sugar he'd kept in his pockets to keep himself warm. Without a doubt, the most iconic characteristic of the White Death's fearsome battle tactics, however, was the weapon he chose to use. Do you remember that old rifle he bought after his national service? Well, ever since 1925, Simo had been taking good care of that M2830 Mosin Nagant. He'd use it when he went hunting, getting to know the way it worked, how to maintain it, and how to ensure it wouldn't jam even in the depths of Finnish winter. And when he was called up to war in 1939, he brought it with him. Simo rejected the much newer Soviet M9130PE, which the Finnish army issued its snipers. He even rejected the use of a scope. Instead, he stuck to what he knew, his 14-year-old rifle with its basic iron sight. He observed that telescopic sights sometimes clouded in the winter and would flash in the sun, giving away the positions of enemy marksmen who he himself had killed. Instead, he aimed for his enemy's chests, not their heads, down the simple sights of his ancient weapon. It was using this peculiar style of sniping that Simo Hauha, the White Death, killed more people with a sniper rifle than any other soldier has in history. Most accurate records suggest that by the time the war was over in March 1940, Simo had a confirmed 259 sniper rifle kills and another 283 by submachine gun, bringing his total number of confirmed kills to 542. Counted among the bodies, Simo cheats death. The Red Army was driven to near insanity by the godlike punishment wrought upon them by the man they knew as the White Death. As the war dragged on and it became apparent that their losses would soon outweigh the few miles of land they had won, they began to throw everything they had at the last known positions of deadly sniper Simo Hauha. They bombed him with artillery, brought in whole teams of snipers to counter his fire. During the Battle of Kola, a single division of the Finnish army, supported by Simo and ten other snipers, even went up against four Red Army divisions and a tank brigade. Yet still they won, and Simo emerged alive. Still, no one's luck can hold out forever. On the 6th of March 1940, just one week before the end of the war, a Red Army soldier got lucky. Hao Ha was hit in the face by an explosive bullet. The bullet, capped with an incendiary mix, tore through the expert marksman's left cheek, removing both his upper and lower jaw. When he was found in the aftermath of the battle, Simo was presumed dead and tossed atop the rising stack of Finnish bodies. It was only later, when a commanding officer ordered he be searched for, that Hao Ha was found twitching on the pile. According to his fellow soldiers, when Simo was pulled out, half his face was missing. He was in a coma, but he was still alive. Surviving the Soviets, the fall of the USSR, and Simo's lasting legacy. Simo Hauha regained consciousness on the 13th of March, 1940, the day that peace was declared in Finland. He awoke to the news that he was in fact dead. At least, this was the rumor that had spread across the country, that the White Death, scourge of the Soviets, had died in battle. As soon as Simo was well enough to put pen to paper, he wrote his local newspaper to correct the mistake. It took 14 months and 26 reconstructive surgeries before Hao Ha would fully recover from his wounds. He was left permanently disfigured as a result, 
but still ready and willing to fight against the Russians when, in 1941, the Continuation War began. His country, however, decided that he had had enough. The Finnish government awarded Simo the first and second class medals of liberty, as well as a name-plated M2830 honorary rifle and a farm in Valakjarvi, near Finland's southeastern border with Russia. Simo once again took up moose hunting, this time often accompanied by Finland's eighth and longest serving president, Urho Kekkonen. He also dabbled in dog breeding and continued farming until it became too difficult for him in old age. Unfortunately, in the aftermath of World War II, understandable backlash against the excess of violence meant that Simo began receiving hate mail and sometimes death threats. His injuries made him instantly recognizable, and so he stopped going into town. He became fairly reclusive and never married, though thankfully he did maintain a circle of friends and remained close to his family. Around the time that the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, an elderly Simo Hauha, who had, in his lifetime, watched the Bolsheviks rise and fall, moved into an apartment in the town of Rukalati. Later, he moved to a war veteran's nursing home in Hamina. It was there, at 95, that the White Death gave his final interview. When asked how he had been so successful in his duty as sniper, Simo Hauha replied with one word, practice. Simo died in 2002 at the age of 96. Do you think there ever was a better sniper than Simo? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to watch my video on Grigory Rasputin. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.